Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Aliens and UFOs video. Alright, let's continue with Chapter 5 from the book UFO Sightings by Alan Baker. This one talking again about the official reactions to the UFO phenomenon, and this will be Part 3. So let's go ahead and let's share the last segments associated with this chapter. This will pretty much wrap up this chapter, and then I'll go ahead on the next part and start talking about Chapter 6. Lots of interesting stuff still to share regarding governmental and other departments official uh, stances when it comes to the UFO phenomenon. We've seen a wide range already, most of it being just under the lines of not really denying it, but not really moving forward on things. And then the other parts are outright stating they're not happening. And then finally, there's some chance when it comes to this. So those are at least the official stances on there. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's start this part here. I'll give my own thoughts and opinions on everything being presented. I'd love to hear what your own thoughts are too. So the next segment is called the Freedom of Information Act. One of the most powerful tools in the arsenal of the UFO researcher is the Freedom of Information Act, which was created in the 1966 Act of Congress and designed to give the public greater access to government records. However, as Lawrence Fawcett and Barry J. Greenwood made clear in their 1984 book Clear Intent, the Freedom of Information Act is not a skeleton key to open every single door behind which important information might lie. In fact, nine types of information are exempt from release to the public and the subjects covered are number one, a specifically authorized under criteria established by an executive order to keep secret in the interest of natural defenses or foreign policy and be are in fact properly classified pursuant to such executive order. Number two are any related solely to the internal personal rules and practices to an agency. Number three is anything specifically exempted from disclosure by statute, provided that such statute requires that the matters be withheld from the public in such a manner as to leave no discretion on the issue or establishes particular criteria for withholding or refers to particular types of matters to be withheld. Number four is anything involving trade secrets and commercial or financial information obtained from a person and privileged or confidential. Number five is anything involving interagency or intra-agency memoranda or letters which would not be available by law to a party other than an agency in litigation with the agency. Number six is any personnel and medical files and similar files that involve the disclosure that which can constitute a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Number seven is any investigatory records compiled for law enforcement purposes, but only to the extent that the production of such records would interfere with enforcement proceedings, the private person of a right to a fair trial or an impartial abdication, constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy, disclose the identity of a confidential source, and in the case of record compiled by a criminal law enforcement authority in the course of a criminal investigation or by an agency conducting a lawful national security intelligence investigation, confidential information furnished only by the confidential source, and then disclosure investigative techniques and procedures or endanger the life or physical safety of law enforcement personnel, and then also anything contained in or related to examination, operating, or condition reports prepared by, on behalf of, or for the use of an agency responsible for the regulation or supervision of financial institutions. And finally, any geological and geophysical information and data, including maps concerning wells. Fawcett and Greenwood list a number of amendments which were attached to the act in 1974, which are relevant to the search of information on the government's alleged knowledge of UFOs. Number one, agencies were to release documents to someone requesting them with a reasonable description of said data. Exact information would not have to be given to gather information on a particular subject. Number two, time limits were placed on agencies in responding to requests. They were allowed 10 working days to respond to the first request, 20 working days for responding to an appeal of a denial of documents, and a single 10-day extension and responding to allow for administrative difficulties. Also, a 30-day limit was placed on an agency in responding to a court case. Number three is set fees were provided for search and reproduction costs. 
This is rated to a 10 cent per page photocopy charge, plus fees for hourly clerical and professional time applied in preparing a response to a FOIA request. Number four, courts could examine and render decisions on whether or not to release documents from agencies brought to the court by those filing requests. And number five, a full report on FOIA requests and their handling by each agency would be provided to Congress annually. As an illustration of how the FOIA works in practice, Fawcett and Greenwood then provide a test case based on an article in the National Enquirer of December 13, 1977, entitled UFOs Spotted at Nuclear Bases and Missile Sites. Although the authors readily concede that this publication is not the most reliable for serious UFO reports, the article nevertheless provided places, dates, and some details which could be verified. So they filed an FOIA request on December 26, 1977 for case files from Loring Air Force Base, Maine, October 27, 28, and 31st, 1975, Wordsmith Air Force Base in Michigan, October 30th, 1975, and Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana, November 7th and 8th, 1975. On February 6, 1978, Fawcett and Greenwood received a reply from the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense, notifying them that the Office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff had identified 24 relevant documents. One of the documents was the National Military Command Center Memorandum dated November 13, 1975, which concerned requests for temperature inversion analysis. In part, the memo stated, the West Hem desk officer will act as a control officer for temperature inversion analysis requests initiated by the NMCC. These requests will be made in conjunction with sightings of unusual phenomenon along the northern U.S. border. Fawcett and Greer will conclude that this is the firm evidence that the U.S. Air Force is continuing to investigate reports of UFOs in the vicinity of military bases. The Air Force has denied all involvement with UFOs since the closure of Project Blue Book in 1969. Whenever a sighting occurred, the NMCC would phone the AFGWC, which is the Air Force Global Weather Central, and ask whether an atmospheric temperature inversion existed in the area. The reader will recall the temperature inversions can sometimes cause a Parent UFOs visible both by radar and eyesight. Interestingly, the authors also relate how another researcher, Robert Todd, filed FOIA requests for all records of temperature inversion analysis performed by the AFGWC for the NMCC in the hope that this would yield a list of UFO incidents considered important enough to investigate by the military. The only information he receives concerned the dates on which such analysis were done. However, subsequent requests filed in 1981 revealed that TIAs were no longer required by the NMCC. When the Department of Defense was asked why this was so, they denied all knowledge of the change in procedure. Fawcett and Greenwood wonder whether the TIAs were discovered to be of little use in explaining the UFO reports being investigated and therefore were dropped. It can thus be seen that while any ultimate documented proof of the reality of genuine UFOs will almost certainly be retained by the authorities under the exemptions listed above, most valuable evidence can nevertheless be gathered through carefully placed FOIA requests. The next segment is called F AFR 200 and JANAP 146. The regulations issued by the authorities particularly United States with regards to UFO sightings, have been the subject of intense interest from UFOlogists over the years. This was especially true in the 1950s, the early 1950s, with the issue of Air Force Regulation 200-2 and Joint Army-Navy Air Force Publication 146. AFR 200-2 was issued towards the end of 1953 in response to the conclusions of the Robert Robertson Report. In effect, the regulation prohibited the release of any information regarding a sighting until a satisfactory explanation had been arrived at by the Air Force. Although UFOlogists concluded from this that the Air Force was engaging in a cover-up of dangerous information on genuine UFO activity, a more down-to-earth answer is evident in the context of the Robertson Report. The reader will recall that the report stated the danger of large number of UFO reports clogging government communication channels, together with the threat of genuine enemy activity being mistakenly dismissed in the wake of such reports. 
The Air Force also considered the morbid national psychology engendered by UFOs to be a real danger, with the threat ever present that skillful, hostile propaganda could induce hysterical behavior and harmful distrust of duly constituted authority. In view of these facts, the true intention of AFR 200-2 was clearly to diffuse the steadily increasing public concern and its concomitant increase in officially made reports. Of somewhat greater interest is JANAP 146, which was issued in December 1953, drawn up by the Joint Communications Electronics Committee and put into effect by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Its full title was Canadian United States Communications Instructions for Reporting Vital Intelligence Sightings, and it set down the correct procedures for reporting information considered by the observer to require very urgent defensive and or investigative action. There were a number of categories of intelligence sightings, including hostile or unidentified aircraft, missiles, UFOs, submarine ships, and suspicious groups of personnel on the ground. The instructions contained within JANAP 146 did not apply onto the military, but also to civil airline pilots who, should they encounter UFO, were liable to a prison term of 1 to 10 years and or a fine of $10,000 if they discussed the sighting with the media or public. The JANAP restrictions were imposed on civil airline pilots in February 1954 after a meeting between intelligence officers and airline representatives. In December 1958, according to Timothy Good, 450 airline pilots sighed in position in protest at the official policy of dismissing UFO sightings. One pilot described the policy as a lesson in lying. 50 pilots had reported sightings only to be told by the Air Force that they had been mistaken. And yet the pilots had also been warned that they faced up to 10 years in prison under JANAP 146 if they revealed details of their sightings to the media. In February 1959, the Royal Canadian Air Force, which was just as concerned with the UFO problem as its American counterpart, issued its communications instructions for reporting vital intelligence sightings, otherwise known as service, in cooperation with the U.S. In March 1996, Service JANAP 146E was issued by the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Canadian Defense Staff. Like its American cousin, it sets down the correct procedures for reporting information of vital importance to the United States of America and Canada. Timothy Good cites further evidence of official involvement with UFOs on the North American content, continent in the form of a memorandum dated November 24, 1967, from Royal Canadian Air Force Wing Commander D.F. Robertson, commenting on the intention to transfer the RCAF UFO files to the National Research Council. In part, the memo states, if NRC accepts the responsibility of investigating UFOs and they work with the University of Toronto in cooperation with the Department of National Defense, in my opinion, we are on the right track. According to Good, Robertson's file contains several reports which he had hoped would convince the NRC that extraterrestrial activity was behind some of the sightings in Canada. The reason for the RCAF's declining interest in UFOs was given thus. The primary interest of UFOs lies in the field of science and to a lesser degree to one that is associated with national security. While ufologists point to the suppressive aspects of JANAP 146, skeptics such as Curtis Peebles remind us that the transmission of reports which might be considered a vital intelligence interest in national security was protected by the U.S. Communications Act of 1934. In addition, reports with intelligence implications were protected by the Espionage Act in the United States and the Official Secrets Act in Canada. This was why those reporting intelligence-related information were forbidden from discussing it publicly. According to Peebles, these provisions were meant to emphasize the necessity for the handling of such information within official channels only. He continues, believers use these penalties, fines, and or imprisonment to put a more sinister meaning on JANAP 146. The provisions for reports of airplanes, missiles, submarine ships, and ground parties were ignored. UFOs were depicted as its only interest. 
Although Peebles is here referring to the stance taken by Major Donald Kehoe and other contemporary ufologists, this criticism is harder to level at UFO researchers today, many of whom do not ignore the other categories of sighting in Janap 146, but merely point out quite reasonably that UFOs are listed as a category entirely separate from the other more mundane sightings. The implication, of course, is that the U.S. and Canadian Air Forces were well aware that some UFOs are not misinterpretations of man-made aircraft or natural phenomena. The next segment is called Extraterrestrial Quarantine Law. In his 1986 book, Extraterrestrial Among Us, researcher George C. Andrews draws attention to an arcane law adopted in July 1969, which effectively prohibits U.S. citizens from having any contact with alien spacecraft or their pilots. According to Title 14, Section 1211 of the Code of Federal Regulations, anyone found guilty of extraterrestrial contact can be jailed for one year and fined $5,000. People who have been extraterrestrially exposed can be quarantined under armed guard for an indefinite period. There is no limit to the number of people who could be detained. Thus, and there are persistent rumors among the more extreme UFO conspiracy theorists that the U.S. government has established a large number of detention camps for this contingency. According to Andrews, the definition of extraterrestrial exposure is left entirely up to the NASA administrator, who is thus endowed with total dictatorial power that to be exercised at the slightest caprice, which is relatively contrary to the Constitution. Uh, the relevant sections of the text of the law are as follows. Uh, 1211.100 scope. This part establishes a NASA policy, responsibility, and authority to guard the Earth against any harmful contamination or adverse changes in its environment resulting from personnel, spacecraft, and other property returning to the Earth after landing on or coming within the atmosphere envelope of a celestial body, and security requirements, restrictions, and safeguards that are necessary in the interest of national security. Section 1211.101, Applicability. The provisions of this part apply to all NASA manned and unmanned space missions which land or come within the atmospheric envelope of a celestial body and return to Earth. Section 1211.102, Definitions. NASA and the Administrator mean, respectively, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration or his authorized representative. Extraterrestrially exposed means the state or condition of any person, property, animal, or other form of life or matter, whatever, who, or which has touch directly or come within the atmospheric envelope of any other celestial body or touch directly or been in close proximity to any person, property, animal, or other form of life or matter who or which has been extraterrestrially exposed by virtue of paragraph B1 of this section. For example, if a person or thing A touches the surface of the moon and on A's return to Earth, B touches A and subsequently C touches B, all of these, A through C, would be extraterrestrially exposed. Quarantine means the detention, examination, and decontamination of any person, property, animal, or other form of life or matter whatsoever that is extraterrestrially exposed and includes the apprehension of seizure or seizure of any such person, property, animal, or other form of life or matter whatsoever. Quarantine period means a period of consecutive calendar days as may be established in accordance with 1211.104. And then it continues with more policies associated with that information. And so, in view of our continuing exploration of space, it seems reasonable enough that provisions should be made for the day, when interplanetary probes will be designed to return to the Earth after landing on the more distant planets in our solar system. The recent discovery of what might be microscopic fossils inside the Martian meteorite known as ALH-84001 means that there is a potential danger from extraterrestrial life, even if that life cannot be seen with the naked eye. George and 
Sanders is disturbed by the fact that the provisions of the quarantine law do not refer only to NASA, manned and unmanned spacecraft. Of course, while the absence of the word only can be construed as meaning the spacecraft from any nation on Earth, uh, could be potential carriers of dangerous extraterrestrial mar m microorganisms and thus could or should be the subject to quarantine procedures for the sake of humanity. It can also be construed to mean any spacecraft, whether from the Earth or another planet. According to Andrews NASA's general counsel, Neil Hosenball, he has admitted that the quarantine law is applicable to space vehicles not originating from Earth. It is extremely unlikely that the government would actually detain people who witness genuine UFOs and aliens under this law, since to do so would be blatantly to admit the reality of extraterrestrial spacecraft and beings, which surely is not on the immediate agenda. However, this ET law has given rise to some very dark speculations in certain quarters, among which that the U.S. government is well aware of the presence of aliens and has formed a draconian contingency plan to deal with human reaction to any large-scale future landing. Also, there is a rather implausible theory that these detention camps will be used to imprison political undesirables after a spurious official announcement that the Earth is under surveillance by hostile alien beings. While the extraterrestrial quarantine law may well include provisions for dealing with exposure to potential harmful material, living or otherwise from other planets, to apply it to UFO contactees seems rather illogical. If alien beings have landed on Earth, as has been reported on numerous occasions, then it surely follows that any contamination will already have taken place. The implication is that if the aliens are really are here, they must have taken their own precautions against harming our environment with extraterrestrial bacteria. Then that's it. That pretty much wraps up Chapter 5, Official Reactions to the UFO Phenomenon from the book UFO Sightings by Alan Baker. So let's go ahead and let's talk about that here. Once again, it's going a little bit into the technical side when it comes to government departments. Lots of initials, right? It seems like there's like an endless list of government departments, each of them having long names and then subsequently having long initials. But at least the first segment, the Freedom of Information Act, that's definitely one of the most popular ones. I see that a lot now on YouTube. Um, it seems like YouTube is uh, showcasing a lot of those shock videos, like people going into offices, requesting XYZ documents and so on. It's just a way to, I guess, get some views or get some exposure and try to present information based on the Freedom of Information Act. So that's at least my knowledge when it comes to that. But it's interesting that it's also used for UFO requests. And so apparently you can try to localize things according to that segment, like try to find a set of dates, a set of locations, and then anything that doesn't fall into those nine categories in terms of restricted documents, you can then try to localize as much as possible relevant documents that could work towards your analysis. So there's that angle, but there's also the idea that even if it is given, a lot of the info could be redacted, blacked out in other words, or once again, just outright denied. And then it was interesting to see, though, the full details as far as the timeline, how it's 10 days here, 20 days here, and then another 10 days and so on. And then the costs associated with it, like 10 cents a page. So if you have the time and you have the patience, you can pretty much do that as far as requesting these things. That'll make a good video if someone has anything like that for YouTube. Like if you wanted to uh, try to officially request such documents, make sure that you could uh, document it and then showcase it afterward on YouTube. Next segment is the AFR 200-2 and JANAP 146. The interesting thing was that JANAP 146, the idea that there's an actual fine slash imprisonment if you have anyone talking about their encounter. So in other words, something involving an encounter could lead up to one to 10 years and a fine of $10,000 specifically to airline pilots. I didn't know that. Somebody might want to point that out. Let me know if you're an airline pilot or were one before. Hey, did you have to sign anything along those lines? Post it in the comments below. I did like though the caveat, like it stated that there was actually another provision like back in 1934 that stated the reason for it is because a lot of those sightings could be actual stuff from Earth, like in other words, from other countries, 
and you don't want the media to be alerted to such sensitive information, especially for security reasons. But again, the, 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 that doesn't catch the headlines. The headlines is, as the, as the segment properly noted, it's the fact that it's UFO stuff that's the only thing that's depicted as its quote unquote only interest. So yeah, you can let someone let me know if that truly applies to this day when it comes to being a pilot, anything along those lines. And then the next one, the extraterrestrial quarantine law. How about that? You can actually be fined one year. I'm sorry, five thousand dollars and jailed for one year. If you have been extraterrestrially exposed when it comes to any type of UFO or any type of, of, of alien contact and you don't go into some quarantine status, there was a lot of stuff described there when it comes to the multiple policies. I had to skip some of it because it was kind of like getting a little bit uh, monotonous and so you can get the idea that if you are found to be within exposure, either from person A to person B, person C, and so on, direct or indirect, and then NASA and then also the NASA administrator both think that you should be quarantined, then you are going to be, and then that's where you have this stuff happening if you don't. So that gives you an idea essentially of what will occur. And then there's the more uh, idea, the more broader idea that what if it's a mass landing, like something happening and a lot of people are exposed. I have no idea about those large number of detention camps that the UFO conspiracy theorists, the ones that were mentioned in this chapter here, if that's the case. But who knows? That's just something else that's just going to be a wait and see approach. But then that's it. That's everything for chapter five. Uh, next part I'm going to continue is going to be chapter six. And we're about halfway through when it comes to this book. But let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. All right, everybody. Thanks again as always. Take care. Bye.